Security in the digital age has acquired new nuances. I was teaching at a class in Berkeley and I asked uh, the classroom, how many of you have sent photographs on your social media messengers uh, which would embarrass you otherwise? And I was surprised that literally the entire classroom had done that. I thereafter asked them, how many of you believe that the platform that you have used should ensure that these are never leaked and they are never available to anyone else other than the recipient who it was intended for. And nearly the entire classroom uh, raised their hands again. And for me, this captured the paradox of the digital age. We are far more expressive as humans. We want to be far more intimate as humans. We want to share much more as humans. And yet, we want the absolute, complete delivery of securing our private and personal space. A full a age of full expression and complete privacy defines individual security in the digital age. Now, I was talking about only uh, one element of what this private space might be. Uh, but in the digital age, uh, the same platforms are used to conduct commerce for your bank accounts, for your um, uh, sharing vital information, for sharing your health records, for talking to your, your kids, to your wife, to your family, to your friends, for conducting your life itself. Your life has gone digital. So when we talk about securing the private space, the digital space, we are actually talking about securing life itself. Security in the digital age is security, securing platforms, mediums, communication channels that will in fact implicate human life. And that is one new nuance that did not exist in the 20th century. The second challenge of security in the digital age is national security. National security was a factor of the territory that uh, nations uh, governed, managed, safeguarded, protected. You had armies, you had institutions, you had governments, you had parliaments, you had uh, various arms of the sovereign that ensured that. In the digital age, the nation, the idea of a nation no longer is limited to uh, the confines of geography. You have escaped uh, territory, you have escaped time itself. Today, incidents happening in uh, faraway uh, countries and lands implicate your national security. The war on terror, which was a product of uh, uh, incidents in the United States of America changed South Asia completely. Similarly, uh, mobilizations that take place in one part of the world uh, challenge regimes in different parts of the world. You have seen campaigns, some of whom uh, uh, many of you would have engaged with around climate change, having a global scape, uh, a global uh, uh, scope and a, uh, a global appeal. And these challenge national arrangements as well. So when the nation resides outside its boundaries, the security is dramatically implicated. National security in the digital age is actually international security. It is international in dimension. It requires international partnerships. It requires new forms of engagement. It is no longer about countries partnering with each other for stability and security. It is about countries partnering with big companies. It is about countries partnering with com uh, communities. It is. Uh, countries engaging with citizens on a whole new dimension. National security is not about the nation state anymore. It is about the individuals, the communities, the companies, and indeed the international uh, community uh, as well. Skilling in the digital age is the second element. What is it that we must possess to take advantage of this age? The short answer? I don't know. And let me also confess, many of those who I have spoken to also do not know. As someone once mentioned, that the majority of jobs that many of the current um, standard 12th of modern school would be engaged with still do not exist. We do not even know the jobs of the future and hence it is going to be extremely difficult to create rigid curriculum for the future. I would place bets on curriculums that are far more flexible, that strengthen traditional human skills, that make you more empathetic, that help you to connect with people, that help you express yourself more creatively. Communications, the fine arts, uh, social sciences, a certain amount of 
uh, skills in mathematic, mathematics, uh, numbers are always good. Uh, it's a universal language. Um, for me, human skills will be the most important element that will be priced at the highest in the future. All other jobs will be done by robots better than you and me. It's the humanity that will keep us and distinguish us uh, and make us unique. Uh, work on that. Be more human. Make the most of the school that you are in. Go into the clay room. Learn how to work the potter's wheel. Express yourself on the canvas. Go to the basketball courts. Play in teams. Work with others. Share. Explore. Express. And be yourself. Be human. That's the most important skill. That will distinguish you from a machine that will begin to do everything better than you in the next two decades. I think more than law and policy, that we are, what we are really struggling with in the digital age is the ability of social sciences to keep up with innovation. Uh, the legal structures are those that come from the 19th century. Uh, much of our constitution, much of, much of our legal uh, information is still 150 years old. The digital age requires a complete reset of what we had assumed as the base requirement of organizing societies. To do that, we require a golden age of social sciences. We require new social theories, new economic theories, new theories of ethics and values and morality. Much of that is going to be decided uh, at the uh, late teens and the uh, uh, early 20s in an in, in a individual's life. We require a, a new schooling system, a new education system. Uh, all of that will contribute to a new uh, uh, approach to law, a new approach to policy making. Uh, but I think the schools are going to be the front line that will help us create architecture for the digital age. It is here in modern school and in many other such schools where we will discover the answers uh, to everything the digital age is uh, posing to us. When you illegally enter into someone's private domain in the digital medium, we generally refer to as hacking. If someone hacks into your computer, steals your files, uh, interrupts your communication, prevents you from doing your normal activities online, is also referred to as hacking. If someone was able to access your passwords, was able to steal money from your bank, was able to change your records, was able to uh, interfere with uh, the business as usual ecosystem that is also under the broad umbrella of hacking. The question is, uh, can hacking be ethical? Uh, and my position there is that uh, uh, ethical hacking is something that we must seriously consider. When the mo biggest dangers to society, to countries, to communities, to enterprises and to individuals are now going to be online, the solutions, the responses, and in many ways, the remedy will have to be discovered online as well. Technology will have to respond to technology. Technical skills will have to be the single most important tool that can respond to these technical bads. For me, legal frameworks, law enforcement, the police force are secondary actors. The primary agents are going to be people uh, who are engaging with the medium themselves. And we do need a cohort, a new cohort, which can do two things. A, prevent uh, the bad actors from interfering with the digital ecosystem. And those talented group sometimes refer to themselves as ethical hackers. They are able to stop a certain incident from occurring by interfering in the bad actors' own ecosystems. They are able to enter their homes and prevent them from coming out and harming others. And in many ways, these ethical hackers are already a part of the global ecosystem that is responding to challenges uh, thrown up by those who want to misuse the system. Sometimes the same hackers prevent governments from um, harming their citizens and they refer to themselves as ethical hackers as well. And this is where the line starts getting blurred. What happens if an ethical group belongs to a different cultural context, decides to interfere in a, another country where the cultural and community engagement norms are different. And this is something that we are uh, grappling with. Uh, can American internet community claim to be representing the best interest of the Russian community? Now, there are certain um, uh, uh, rights and principles we have all agreed at the United Nations. And I believe the defense of those rights is ethical. The defense of the values we have all signed on to uh, at the United Nations 
uh, under the three documents of rights that we have established uh, is ethical for me. But some of them, um, and some countries, and some communities, and some of my peers disagree with that. Uh, so I think the domain of ethical happy hacking is both uh, contested and very interesting. Uh, many countries have their own uh, cyber warriors who continuously prevent their opponents from harming the country. Uh, are they ethical? Uh, are they agents of the state? Are they the new age James Bond? Are they uh, the new age CIAs and uh, RAWs? Uh, I don't have the answer, but they do exist. Similarly, many enterprises are now uh, employing uh, the same warriors to protect their uh, uh, financial values and operations. Uh, is there something ethical about it? Or are these new age security guards, the bouncers outside clubs, are they the digital uh, versions of those? Again, it's a contested um, area, but certainly one that must be engaged with. Uh, and I think uh, we will eventually, as a community, be able to discern the good hackers from the bad ones, uh, but the debate has begun and they certainly do exist. You know, there was an interesting uh, graph I saw recently which uh, told me that uh, even as good, the flow of goods and services has plateaued uh, across the globe, the movement of goods and the movement of services from one country to the other has stagnated over the last few years. Uh, the flow of data is increasingly uh, uh, growing rapidly. In fact, there's an exponential growth in the flow of data across borders. Data seems to be uh, the carrier of new value in the digital age. Data is where wealth is embedded and through which wealth is created. And there is this big debate, therefore, that who should control and how should we manage this flow of data. Countries believe that data creates value and data, therefore, must be managed by the nation state. Uh, we must ensure that the data Indians create, for example, uh, must serve uh, the interest of Indian citizens. Uh, the wealth that this data is able to create through innovation in uh, apps and technology solutions, uh, the largest share of that uh, value should flow back to India. Uh, uh, the access to data for law enforcement, for responding to crime, for responding to terror activities uh, must be such that uh, the nation state uh, must be able to uh, uh, benefit from having this information. And this whole debate around data is uh, creating uh, divisions in uh, the digital ecosystem around the world. One school of thought believes that uh, global internet requires data to be able to be uh, flowing globally. Uh, I think that has dominated the spirit of the development of the technology sector over the last 20 years. More recently, uh, certain geographies believe that uh, they must be able to manage this flow of data. The European Union has come out with its uh, data protection uh, framework called the GDPR. Please go and look it, up, look it up and read it online. And they are seeking that certain provisions must be established before this data is shared with any other geography. The Indian government is in the process of putting together its own uh, uh, data protection law, which will in some ways uh, restrict or condition the flow of data across the net. Uh, data sovereignty is an idea that the Indian Minister for Communications and Information Technology has strongly advocated for. Uh, data produced in India, data of Indians, must be protected and served by the Indian sovereign. It must be uh, uh, a domain that must not be usurped by uh, external jurisdictions. Uh, the wealth that this data cre creates must first serve Indians and thus then must be shared with the world. And data sovereignty, therefore, uh, is a new uh, proposition which has been posed by certain countries including India.